Einen schönen guten Tag und herzlich willkommen zu unserem heutigen Athena-Seminar hier an der Universität Wien. Good afternoon and welcome everybody to the second seminar within our Athena Seminar Series, the European University Initiative from European Uni uh, Policy to Practice on the Ground Solutions for Smart Integration. My name is Eva Kurek and I will be guiding you through our seminar today. The topic of our seminar is interlinking with regional stakeholders. And here we would like to discuss about the question, how can European university alliances integrate industrial innovation ecosystems? And I'm really happy that I can welcome at least some of our guests in person today, even though the pandemic situation is quite difficult at the moment, but we are really happy that we could still carry out this event in a hybrid format. So welcome to all our on-site participants here on the campus. And of course, I would also like to welcome all our online participants. We were really happy when we saw the high number of registrations and it's great that we have both representatives from the European University Alliances with us today, as well as representatives from the industry. So a warm welcome goes out to all of you in front of your screen. Um, as you might, might have seen on the agenda, we have a quite tight program for the next two hours, so I will start right away by introducing our first speaker for today. Please welcome Professor Robert Roth, who is our Athena project leader at the University of Wien. He is also the director of the Center for International Capacity Development, and he held the chair for automatic control engineering at our university for 20 years. And in his introduction, Hubert will give us some general information about our alliance, about our goals regarding cooperation with uh, industry partners and about the aim of our seminar today. So welcome, Hubert. Yeah, thank you, Ilka, for this nice introduction. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen here in the room. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, friends, partners in our, pro uh, in our project or in other uh, European alliances. Welcome to this uh, session this afternoon. As Ilka already mentioned, I will give a short introduction first uh, about what is a uh, European university, because probably not all of the participants, especially the participants uh, outside this room, know about this initiative. Then I will uh, shortly represent our special alliance, Athena, and finally, I will come uh, to the topic which we are so for which we are here uh, this afternoon. Yeah, the initiative of European universities started more or less in 2017, 2018 by the politician. And the argument was uh, in Europe, we have a lot of university. Many of them are small and middle sized. And how can we compete with the big universities in the United States or in Asia? What can we do? And one of the conclusions finally in my 20, 2018 was that uh, politics said, okay, we want significantly enhance mobility and foster high quality and excellence in education and research. So this is a citation of this, let's say, decision. And based on this decision, uh, 41 alliances have been established meanwhile by within two calls. The first call was in 2019, the second call in 2020, and one of the alliances which have been established is our alliance, Athena, and we are one of the so-called second batch. We're uh, all together, as I said, 41, and the second batch was 24 university alliances. What are the main topics or key elements of uh, Athena, of the European University in especially, but of course also of Athena? Of course, European University wants to establish a, a group of universities to become more powerful, to have more possibilities in education, in research, to get probably also in the rankings or in the international rankings on a higher position than each of the single university can come. So how can we do this? Of course, we need, all of us need students. And this alliance, of course, gives us now the possibility to have mobility of students, mobility on each level in bachelor and master or also in PhD. And of course, we need integrated long-term strategies for education 
and also for research. And for research, uh, not only at the universities, but also bringing this research into industry. And industry is one of the big topics which we want to discuss today. And to bring this knowledge to the industry, of course, it's important to have an have a, uh, important knowledge transfer to the stakeholders in the near surrounding of the single university, but also to make it possible now, because of the link of the universities, to also link the industry of these different countries. The answer of uh, European University calls, which we have uh, given, was our project Athena, Advanced Technology Higher Education Network Alliance. When, when I say we, then I mean a group of seven universities. The leader is the Polytechnic Institute of Porto. We have also Nicolo Cusano in Rome. We have the University of Orléans in France. We have a University of Maribor in Slovenia. And we have also Hellenic University in Breed. And finally, last but not least, Vilnius Technical University in Lithuania. We have altogether about 10,000 staff members. We have more than 120,000 students. And that are, of course, numbers now with which we can compete also with, with big universities worldwide. What are our, our common goals in Athena? Of course, we want to create inclusive, innovative, and highly qualified international education. We want to internationalize study programs. And this request, of course, to improve mobility. It also requests, of course, to have changes in the traditional national languages. We need international language, mostly English language in our courses. We have to orientate ourselves to the needs of the global uh, labor market because, of course, we want to uh, finally reach their goals. We want to satisfy their needs. That would increase employability of our students, would give probably better career opportunities. And finally, for us as universities, we are also hoping to establish inter national research groups, including regional industrial partners. This all supports the development of a sustainable and safe digital economy. Our project is, uh, yeah, is managed, is organized in nine work packages. I don't want to go through them. I only want to mention the work package industry because that is the main work package package we in Sweden are working on, and it's also the topic of our seminar today. The cooperation with our university uh, and, and enterprise, enterprise cooperation practices are we want to collaborate within Athena together with industrial partner, partners, especially in research and development. But also we want to include the industrial partners in education. For example, that industrial experts teach courses in our university. Or we want to increase employability, internationalization. That means internships in companies, internships in foreign countries, in companies. We want to support long, long life, uh, lifelong learning programs. Also, facilities which we have at the universities could be interesting for industrial partners. But sometimes also industrial partners have, have uh, also facilities which we do not have, but which we can probably offer and share. And we want to, to have joint workshops. We have events like joint publications or job fairs or things like that. Knowledge transfer is an important topic in that way. Knowledge transfer must be effective. And it must therefore involve companies in education. It must support the creation of startups, the creation of industrial, probably PhD programs, where PhD students work in an industry or together with industry in special topics for our society. 
which are important for the society. And we have a lot of important topics coming for the next future, uh, next uh, years in decarbonization, in digitalization, and things like that. So we have to offer R&D services and facilities to companies, as I mentioned also. For this, we have to provide transversal courses to develop entrepreneurship uh, competencies also. We want now today in our seminar have, uh, let's say, a topic to discuss. How can European University Alliance integrate industrial innovation ecosystems? This is a series of, two, of four uh, uh, presentations. One of them has already been on 18th November in Maribor. The reason why we have these four is that uh, the presidency of the European Union has changed from Germany to Portugal to Slovenia and to France. And our alliance, Athena, is the only of these alliances which is has uh, partners from all these four countries. And therefore, <clears throat> the first presentation was in Slovenia. Ours is now in Germany. The next will be in one week in Orléans. And finally, we will have one in Porto on 14 December. And from these four workshops, from these four seminars, probably arise questions, arise problems, challenges, which we want to summarize. And finally, which we want to report in a political event in February, on 28th of February, in Orléans in France, where also hopefully politics are included in the participation, in the participants, so that we can bring our needs our challenges to the ears of these persons. Therefore, the main focus <clears throat> of today's seminar is more or less three topics. We want to foster international research cooperation between industry and universities. We want to discuss the increase of employability of university graduates, for example, to, to support industry because of the shortage of skilled workers, which is a for some of the areas in industry, a big problems. And we want to create innovative opportunities in uh, education and research. So that is, as I said, the main topic of this seminar. And that is the end of my short talk. And if you have any questions, we ask you probably to ask the questions via chat. Because otherwise, uh, from technical problems or po technical possibilities, it's easier for us to answer questions which are given in chat. Thank you. So thank you, Robert, for this introduction. And as you have seen, uh, probably on the agenda, we will have or we will see all our speakers again today later in the second part of our seminar during the panel discussion. So there will also be the chance to ask questions and discuss with our speakers there again. But um, yeah, if there are any urgent questions right now already or specific questions regarding the presentations, just feel free to put your question in the chat. Now, looking at my colleagues, are there any questions yet? No. Not yet. Okay. This makes it even easier for us to keep the time schedule. So um, the next speaker I would like to introduce um, is our first speaker from outside the Athena Consortium today. He came by train from Hamburg this morning. Welcome Sascha Dietler from the Hamburg University of Technology, which is part of another European University Alliance, namely the European Consortium of Innovative Universities, ECIU. And here Sascha is the so-called challenge coordinator of ECIU. And I'm excited to hear what challenges you are dealing with in your job and um, how regional cooperation works in your alliance. So welcome, Sasha Dietla. So, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Kurek, for the nice introduction. Uh, as you already meant, I'm um, Sasha Dietla from the Hamburg University of Technology, and I'm challenge coordinator of the Hamburg University of Technology, even within the ECIU University. Uh, like Professor Wood already mentioned, there were two batches already with the European Alliances and the ECIU University was one of the first ones, so we started already in 2019. 
Um, in our main insights, I've tried to give you a short and a brief introduction within the next up to 10 minutes, I would say, uh, within this presentation. And so, the European Consortium of Innovative Universities started more or less like in um, 1997 with the huge consortium, which we already have, um, which is basically based up upon 12 European partners and one associate partner in Mexico. As you might know, Mexico is not Europe, but still we have good connections, we have good operations there and still um, working deeply together in all these kind of questions facing all of us, um, all of us over the world. Um, yeah, we have one member per country um, within these, I mean, you can see it on the map on the right hand side here on the slide where the red little stripes are. So we are quite good covered in the northern part of Germany, we are quite good covered in Spain, Portugal. Um, so yeah. So very, very good focus there in a European or an Eastern European partner would be um, great as well to have. I mean, we have Lithuania already included, um, but maybe for the next call, which might, up, um, might be upcoming for the next uh, period of time, then we are seeking for another partner, maybe in the Eastern Europe. Um, so we're uniting over 300,000 models like students, like 50,000 staff, um, or around 500 research groups all over in our research um, <laughs> consortium here, yeah, which, um, yeah, and all these kind of presidents and the vice rectors, et cetera, came together at one day and it was told to me that it was like 2017 and they were just discussing about the future of education. They were faced with the issues of climate crisis, et cetera, and we're, we're just deeply thinking and wondering about what should future um, learning should look like. And out of this, the ECA University um, as an idea, as a virtual European university came out of their minds. Um, and yeah, it has some some very, very nice, according to my opinion at least, and some nice um, ideas already that we are just focusing on. I think a good way to show you the main ideas is within this short video, which I will try. ECRU is the leading international consortium of research intensive universities with collective emphasis on innovation, creativity and societal impact. ECRU has 13 member universities all over Europe and one in Mexico. The universities have a joint vision on the future of universities and run education, mobility and research projects with the involvement of all partners since 1997. The partners of ECIU are ready to increase existing collaboration and set up an ambitious joint European university, ECIU University. The plan for ECIU University is co-created with industry, public organizations, society, academics, future and current students at stakeholder events all over Europe. All the inputs brought together in our application for the European University's call of the European Commission. All ECIU member universities are committed to the vision described in this application and also industry partners and the regional authorities of the member universities support the ECIU University. Here all challenges are listed according to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Challenges can be joined and submitted by anyone. Sandeep created one of the challenges related to goal number 11, which focuses on making cities and communities more sustainable. Now people from industry, society and university can found a team and work with him remotely on the challenge. During the project, they notice that they lack a certain skill to continue the project. Therefore, they take micro-credentials suited to their learning needs, which are offered by the European Innovative Universities. They can range from online courses to study packages, to summer schools, to research projects, to courses from industry. After the successful completion, all learning will be documented in a European learning passport. Here, his or her micro-credentials, as well as all skills obtained through the project, are listed. Every challenge ends with a specific outcome, which can be spin-offs, new research questions, new challenges, and most importantly, a better and more sustainable world. The world's constantly changing, therefore education needs to adapt. The Innovation Lab makes sure that ECIU University is providing the best platform to work together on the challenges of the world. Innovative frontrunners like the ECIU member universities are not afraid of taking risks and truly innovate Europe's educational landscape. The future of education starts now. ECIU University. Challenging conventional thinking. So what you have might have seen is that our main uh, learning uh, well, approach is like the church-based learning format where we would like to approach or I like to offer like two different learning offerings, which are called like challenges and micro modules. 
The challenges will be the main focus of today because this is the main part where industry comes into um, consideration where we can really cooperate very, very closely together. Um, yeah, I mean, all these kind of outcomes then, because in universities, of course, we always talk about ECTS and how can you credit these and those kind of things. And we have the approach of micro credentials that we have more like skills um, and abilities that we gain within our challenges while pursuing those and then coming forward um, and gathering even these kind of competences, put them into a digital passport, um, and then even can show them all over the world um, with, for example, um, softwares like the European. Uh, like the like the Euro pass. Um, so the challenge based learning format, how is it look like? Shall I just put it here? Let me show it here. So at the very top, you can just imagine the industry partner comes to us and gives us an idea about a challenge, what he is facing, what is he thinking about, what is he facing actually in his real um, life currently. This is on the very top, the so-called big idea. Then we can start running with the first phase, the so-called engage phase, where we have um, gather some learners, some interested parties who would like to, to approach this kind of a big idea. They are getting motivated for us, like giving some insights about this kind of topic, what to deal with in the upcoming weeks, months, or even years. Um, by the end of the engage phase, and this is the main focus even for, because it's a very learners-centered approach that we would like the learners to, to formulate their own challenges out of the main challenge or the big idea that comes from industry then. So, they come from different disciplines, they come from different internationalities, they just come together, bring uh, together their minds, and then they're coming up with the challenges by the end of the engage phase. Uh, the second phase, then the investigate phase, leads uh, our learners then and the groups of learners to investigate into the different topics. So they are actually, yeah, the actual research takes place in this kind of phase. Um, and then they even go within the solution, hopefully up after the end of the investigation phase, they have a solution already provided, which they can act on um, in the third phase and then and, yeah, reflect on and try to establish a fine tune um, to come to a very, very nice result in the end. And for sure, as you can see here, it's a circle already. So it starts and affects the big idea that came from industry then once again, because there might be some minor steps uh, bringing forward to coming to a solution. Then. So as you might learn from this kind of um, short interactive challenge-based learning format, the learner's perspective is very, very much a focus here. They define their own challenges. They take, they have main responsibilities about the competition, about what they would like to deal with. And the teacher, like we know it from universities these days, they become all this like, uh, we call them teachers because they are part of the team. Um, and they are in but teaching as well. And they're more or less like guiding and facilitating the overall process from the learners um, approaching and tackling these kind of challenges from their own. Um, yeah, so once again, step by step. So we have the real life challenge from industry, from society, from universities. Everybody can more or less like approach us and try to formulate a challenge, bring it to a learners group, which will be gathered then. Um, and micromodule will be assigned by an AI actually, and then in the end, so that the skills and competences um, by the ETCL um, software products, for example, which com contains more than like 13,000 different um, skills. Um, and these kind of gain skills will then stored in the uh, digital competence passport um, yeah, as well as like the representative for the credits. These days we have the so-called chat, so our ECIU challenge platform, which contains um, already within this three-year pilot phase already around um, 17 challenges and over 90 micromodules. Micromodules I haven't mentioned yet so much in deep. It's more or less like small learning units fitting to these kind of challenges so that the learners can even educate themselves or together with um, these kind of uh, modules. Um, yeah, just to educate themselves on certain topics to tackle the challenge even more in depth. The link is here even in the presentation. Main focus topic-wise for us is sustainable cities and communities because we figured out that our universities and our um, consortium of um, universities is basically specified on this kind of SDG because it contains the sustainable cities and communities and we have so many different approaches and ideas and, and expertise and these kind of, so that we just focused on this for now. For sure, in upcoming phases, when the real action takes place, it might um, expand, of course. So the long-term research strategy then focuses on energy and sustainability, circular economy, transport, 
mobility and resilient communities is just just more or less like important for the industry parts to know because we can only or that we would like to focus our um, challenges just on these topics mainly. If they are tackled on that, we are very happy to um, to offer them within our platform. And yeah, by doing this within our ecosystem of these yeah, universities, just here the um, as I would call a very nice graphic just to show how the interlinks should work in the future. Everybody should work together. It's like the main challenge that we are facing these days. But there's just too much, um, yeah, not thinking out of the box, not working out of the box, and that when we cooperate, and there's so much knowledge out there already, so much practitioners out there that know so much and have so great abilities. And if we combine these kind of abilities together, we can achieve a lot in the future. Um, yeah, therefore, I would like to thank you for now. For sure, I will take place in the podium discussion. I'm happy to answer some questions. Nice insights and activities, of course, aligned, especially regarding the challenge based learning approach. Thank you. 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 Pilot phase already started like a year earlier than the pilot phase of Atina or the other alliance of the second round. And as you said, we have a collaboration history since 1997 already. So um, we can uh, really learn a lot from your experience regarding all kinds of aspects, I guess. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Are there any questions uh, for the time? Yes. On the chat, maybe for them the question. Yeah, yeah I have a question about the practicality. I mean, I love your idea, uh, your ideas, and uh, I think that's a really a way uh, regionally uh, based and uh, a university which takes responsibility of the environment is should should move. I completely love it. The only question is, how are the practicalities? Uh, is it working? Because uh, I mean, uh, I, we did similar formats here in Singapore, and I can tell you two things. Uh, the one thing was it is really hard work because if you for, for teacher for people uh, teaching uh, because uh, when you give a lecture you know you give I'm saying badly but it's true partly uh, ten years the same lecture you know you don't need to prepare much anything else, uh, you know so and um, but if you do this type of teaching then um, you um, you really need to engage and you need to engage as a as 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 a, as a as a teacher into things which you don't know or which you only partly know because the problems which come out of practice they are not uh, they don't fit necessarily with your scope of abilities and your scope of where you can help so that is, I, I don't think that's really a problem but it's a problem in our way of thinking as people who uh, who teach and uh, and act um, and I would like to know how you and your colleagues and the second question I think Petra uh, asked you before is how did the companies uh, react to that? Are they open? Do they want? And what I learned um, when I did something similar, I saw that the companies in the beginning started with very peripheral problems because they didn't uh, because they didn't trust that the students uh, um, would do something sensible and then. Our students also felt a little bit, um, uh, how to say that, um, they felt uh, they felt working on peripheral problems, and uh, and only over time um, we 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 made the companies work with us on more serious and interesting problems because our students learn more when they uh, when they uh, when they work on real problems because then there is real engagement also on the company side. Um, so let me answer the second one. I'll give try to give an answer to the second question first, because um, it's definitely a great challenge that we are all facing in here. But the expectation manager that we do just in, uh, just in uh, yeah, the communication pathways that we do with our industry partners is very very much key in this kind of thing. Because they shouldn't know. I mean, this, the challenge is not formulated in terms of okay, just give me an answer. What is two plus two? And then there's four, and then yeah, we did it. It's more or less like a very broad topic. Um, for sure, the industry partner know that it's not something that they are tackling on a high priority. It's something that is underlying them for, for years already, um, where they could give some insights. 
Um, and this is then uh, when you talk briefly about these kind of topics with the industry partner, they're very happy regarding the teaching process. Uh, for sure, it's very difficult, but that's why it's important for us to focus for now on the SCG 11, because we know that we have the expertise in terms of teaching and then we know we have the expertise of teachers in our consortium combined. So the challenge comes to us and then me, for example, as uh, once again, as a challenge coordinator and each partner university has one challenge coordinator has to um, have a deep look in its own or in his or her own university and then check, okay, where's the expertise tackling this kind of challenge in terms of um, providing some kind of a solution to the challenge. For sure, they cannot know everything. This is sometimes tough to talk to some um, professors even who might even have the assumption that they know a lot. <laughs> and not even all of it, um, and then you can tell them, ah, oh, there might be no aspect that you, whatever. And therefore, these days, most of the time, scientific assistants, for example, and PhD candidates are teaching, and they are just part of the learners group. Um, and as you might have heard from me, I'm, I'm not talking about students anymore, I'm talking about learners. Even the teachers, teachers are learners in this kind of um, approach. Okay, so thank you again, and we will see you later in the panel. Yes, thanks. Next speaker I would like to introduce today could unfortunately not visit us in Siegen, but he's participating from his office in Vilnius, Lithuania. A warm welcome to Dr. Justinas Janolevicius. Justinas is an associate professor for financial IT, fintech, and cybersecurity cyber at the Vilnius Gediminas Technical University. And he's also the chief technology officer of a fintech company in Vilnius named Mobilietchi Mukeime. And I've been practicing the pronunciation of this company name for quite a while. I hope this was correct now, more or less. Uh, so if you're interested in this company, just look the name up in the agenda and then you can Google for more information. So to sum up, Justinas is very experienced in the field of cybersecurity, fintech IT systems, and he's very interested in technology transfer from academia. The title of his keynote talk today is Towards a Holistic European Innovation Driven Environment. So welcome, Justina, and the floor is yours. There we go. So hello, everybody. It is a great pleasure to, for me to participate in such, a, in such an interesting event. And it's a pleasure to meet you, at least virtually. Um, and uh, yeah, my name is Justina Sandravichus. And what I wanted to say and what, what I wanted to tell you today is a little story. And the story begins with the fact that I have always been very much fascinated by how technology changes us and how it changes our behavior. And it started in a very early age. And by saying very early age, when I was a little child, I remember uh, how fascinated I was by the cars because they could, there's a little box with wheels and you get into the box and it can take you places very fast, very safely. So basically it meant freedom, technology meant freedom to me. And uh, about that and about innovation, uh, there are several things that I would like you to take home with you. I'm sorry, my computer is lagging. Uh, to take home with you. And the first one and the first idea that I would like you to take home is, uh, comes from Thomas Edison. And it's older than 100 years. Uh, and it says, the value of an idea lies in, in the using of it. What it means is that you can have the best idea and not use it and put it on a shelf and then it becomes worthless. But an idea becomes priceless when you use it, when you're able to facilitate it. And thinking about that and my fascination about cars, I was always wondering why squirrels don't have cars? Because it's so much easier. Because you see, we as people, we have cars, we travel around, but squirrels, they could have the, those little cars that they would, uh, that they would really use and, and facilitate, but for some reason they don't. And uh, I started thinking about it, and the more I thought about it, the more I understood that there is a circle uh, that is, is a closed loop. Uh, the only mission of a squirrel is to collect enough food, so therefore nuts, so that it can survive. And especially if the winter is coming, it's even worse. You have to collect even more nuts. And then the survival question becomes so uh, obsessive that you're not able to uh, generate new ideas. And why is that? Uh, because you are not able to stop. So 
when, when you are in a cycle and you're just doing things that you're used to doing, you cannot ask questions such as how and why things work. And knowing these things and how and why those things work, they give you room for improvement. And this improvement is crucial uh, in order to evolve. So the idea here is that human ability to stop and think comes from a, uh, from a thing that we, we manage to build social structures and we manage to support each other so that we don't have to gather food all the time. And while not gathering food, we had some time to contemplate things. And uh, this thinking led to creating new ideas. And you know, you probably already understand that innovators are extremely lazy people. And in, in that sense that they don't want to repeat the task again. So they will look for the solution that once you complete your task, you don't have to get back to it ever again because it's either automatic or it's very easy or you can just you know rely on others uh, to fulfill it for you. So this innovation thing co comes as a lazy effort to not do anything anymore. Now, if we look into that, and if we look into the word innovation and what it means, there are many uh, explanations of, uh, of this word, but what I think is very important to understand is that, uh, well, I really like uh, the innovator Nick Skilcorn, who wrote uh, many books about innovation. And uh, he says that innovation is turning an idea into a solution that adds value from a customer's perspective. So what that means is that if you want to have innovation uh, to be called innovation, it's not a new technology that is innovation because new technologies, as we discussed previously, can be uh, built, created and put somewhere like away and not used anymore. And if you if you put that away, it doesn't have any contribution to the society. If you want uh, the technology to contribute to society, you have to look at innovation as what does the end user get from it? So uh, in that sense, technology becomes innovation only in one sense when it's used. And we heard that not only from uh, this author, but also we, we've heard it from uh, Steve Jobs many times. He said that uh, those uh, technologies, such as the one of the latest technologies that he participated in, in implementing was touch screens, that they were worthless because they were created a long time ago, but they were worthless because they were never used in products that would make people happy, make their lives easier, uh, and so on and so forth. Therefore, now we're looking at innovation uh, concept like an end, from end user's perspective. Now, what's important here is that to create innovation, we need a certain uh, value chain here. Uh, to improve products, first of all, we need talent. And that talent means anyone who is able to stop, think, and generate new ideas that could contribute to, to the well-being of society by implementing or creating new ideas that could be turned into technology, that could be turned into products. This talent, however, would be uh, useless if it was not educated properly. And this means that we, uh, as, university, uh, as universities, we can provide a certain framework for those uh, talents to be shaped in a way that they could take all of the knowledge that has been before them, implement their little innovative point, and then create something new. And then right after education and between education and research comes another very important part, which is not mentioned here, it's the idea. So basically when you get an idea, when you're educated, talented, and get an idea, you can uh, do research on it and to find where can it lead us. Doing research, of course, is a very painful process, but it leads to generating new ideas or technologies. So if we get those technologies, as mentioned before, they're very good, but they are not considered innovation until they are turned into product. So just between technology and product uh, is a thin line where our innovation requires not only uh, universities or academia, but it requires industry or business to participate there, otherwise we cannot uh, achieve uh, innovation. Now, if we look at, about this innovation, uh, we get this rather interesting, uh, let's call it soup. We get innovation soup uh, that has two components, university and business. So uh, 
it might not look from the first glance that it makes sense, but if we look from to a not so far away history, and if we look at the uh, 1950s, 1957, uh, to be more precise, uh, when Frederick Terman, uh, the Dean of Stanford Engineering School, decided to uh, make this new initiative that was called Silicon Valley, uh, which ended up in being the largest hub for technology transfer and uh, which uh, raised such giants. I'm not talking about the modern giants, but the first ones uh, like Hewlett Packard uh, that made their their way into the global economy and changed the way the the whole Silicon Valley is looked upon from that moment on. So what is desired is basically to build a funnel of innovation and uh, to to look into that and to from from this perspective is we we have a question why do we want to be the next silicon valley when we can build our own we when we can build our own uh, uh, own ideas and we can build our own uh, frameworks that would lead to this generation of innovation and yes of course there are initiatives uh, here and there and some great collaboration examples to look up to but this funnel idea which is just like a drawing a schematic drawing here would be i think the most uh, revolutionizing one so uh to make things a little bit clearer because i was talking in quite an abstract manner i would like to uh, tell a little story maybe and uh, this is about a guy named bob and uh, Bob was or is a regular guy who decided that he wanted to do something. He comes from business and he decided that he wanted to build a very uh, sophisticated artificial intelligence based uh, system that would help him predict certain things that would happen in the future, maybe in the financial market. And uh, what he wanted to do is we wanted to be the first one uh, in the market. He wanted to be the leader. So the story goes like this. Uh, he went to several universities. He asked questions from uh, who could help him build what. And uh, the end result was that there was one university who could help him with uh, building the artificial intelligence engine, another one who could build him uh, the user interface that would uh, suit the ergonomics and uh, the and fit the habits of of, uh, of the end user so that they and he was trying to build that uh, product using these two uh, inputs but the result it was not very satisfactory and um, what's interesting here is that bob although his name is different uh, bob is a real person and the effort was actually real and he was trying to build a system but why wasn't it su as successful as it could have been is for one simple reason. There was no uh, unanimous centralized uh, experience for him where uh, different entities or different universities would would have their input, but with with a centralized organization of it. So he basically got the fractured image, which ended up in not such a satisfactory result. My idea here and I wanted, what I wanted to tell here was and it's the second idea that is worth mentioning that I would very much like you to take home is that innovation uh, equals research and development as a product. So if we change the paradigm as uh, the way we are looking into the R&D and the universities and the innovation, uh, we should understand that universities are no longer the supporting part for the industry and the economy. They are the key component that provides ideas to be converted into innovation. So what comes from here, and my last point here would be that technology transfer uh, could shift from a supporting service to a fully functional uh, product. And we should look at it in that sense if we want to have innovation and if we want to uh, be winning with the innovation in, uh, global, on the global market, and if we want to be competing against uh, the other big players uh, elsewhere. So these are, uh, the ideas that I wanted to share with you, and I hope uh, it was just a little bit interesting for you. And I'm glad to answer any of your questions if you have any. Thank you very much, Christina, uh, for this great, important talk. 
and uh, especially for stressing out the importance of a well-functioning communication and cooperation between universities, research institutions and the businesses. And as I told you before, I really much also liked uh, the view on innov innovation from the evolutionary perspective, as I'm actually a biologist, so this made it a bit better understandable for me. Right. Uh, so, do we have any questions from the audience here on site or from the online participants? Yes, uh, thank you to Justinas and Paul. Uh, thank you, okay. <laughs> this, this is fast, yeah, okay. So, thank you very much and then we will also see you later in the panel discussion. So, now we are already at the end of the first part of our seminar today. And um, at this point, I would like to hand over the moderation to my colleague, Peter Harin Bolivar, who will be leading the panel discussion. Peter is a, a full professor for high frequency and quantum electronics at the University of Siegen. He is also the speaker of the Innovation Ecosystems Strategy Group of the European University Association, and he's leading the work package on industry cooperation within Athena. So, welcome, Peter. Welcome to all our panelists, and I will hand over the moderation to you. So, thank you very much, Ilka, for the kind introduction. Dear colleagues, please step on to the to the front, uh, and uh, we will soon then change the camera so that uh, all the colleagues abroad can also see us all. And so, uh, Uwe. Please, Sasha. Then it's uh, my honor to, to introduce uh, perhaps also first uh, Anne, Anne de uh -huh. She is our colleague uh, from Athena University with a remarkable international uh, uh, background. And so uh, uh, she speaks perfect German as she was educated at uh, the at the University of Tübingen and at the Sorbonne, later PhD in Cambridge, a postdoc in King's College, and so it's like the creme de la creme of the international uh, universities in this planet. We're really glad that you took the effort to come and to visit us in person, and so I'm uh, very glad to have you here for our discussion. Okay. Very happy to be here. And then I would also like to introduce uh, uh, our vice rector for, for uh, digital technologies and for, for, for tech transfer, Volker Wolf. Uh, he made his uh, informatics studies at uh, the ABTH, also my alma mater, and I'm the Mexican here in the group, so uh, <laughs> for, for the CIU University, uh, later made his uh, PhD in Dortmund and had a, a lot of different uh, uh, research states uh, at, at an arbor in, in, uh, and in different uh, MIT and very renowned also international studies. And so it's a great pleasure to have you all, all of you here uh, and discuss. We have like one hour to uh, make a bit of a discussion between us and between the colleagues who are abroad. Uh, also, Justina, you, I hope you can hear us. Perhaps you can give a a sign. I hear you. Yes. Okay, perfect. So that you are at least uh, partially here. Uh, and so uh, we have had very nice, interesting uh, 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 initial discussions. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, we see the, the the international pressure building up for 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 innovation. Yeah. Uh, we need a lot of pops to compete in the future. And uh, uh, perhaps as a first round of, 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 of discussions to, to each one of you, uh, in your various role, we see like uh, a, a radical change of universities coming down from the ivory tower and now taking up really innovation as their core mission and learning. Yeah, we, the universities are learners in coming back from the, the ivory tower in, in developing innovation and innovation has to be brought to the market. Yeah? And so uh, what's your perception of this trans transformation of the role of universities? Perhaps one first round to warm up the, our discussion of each, uh, each of us. Yeah? Uh, I don't know, would you like to start, uh, Polka? Yeah, um, I, I'm, um, I'm, I'm a little bit, um, the interesting question is what can universities do 
or my question uh, to answer your question. My my my, I would reformulate somehow a little bit your question. And um, for me, the question is: What is the role of universities in in regional innovation systems? Um, well, if we were the MIT, we would probably say in global uh, uh, innovation systems. But uh, as a university, uh, as we are, we have a strong uh, regional responsibility, and this regional responsibility gives us. Also, as a raison d'être, you know that's 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 obvious. So, so then the question is, what what role do we have? And um, and I think um, a lot of the role is around. Um, I it's I don't think that the traditional concept of transfer for university like ours works because we don't have um, we don't have that many patents. We don't have that um, uh, that fundamental um, uh, uh, um, uh, basic uh, 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 knowledge which we could easily um, uh, which we could easily transfer or or make uh, products out. I think the strength of which what we have here uh, at our place is a, a collaboration with the regional actors. You know, and uh, and, and innovative innovation oriented collaboration with the regional actors i think that is a, that from my point of view that's the best what we can do in the regional innovation ecosystem because and, and that mean, means we need to build trust because it, that's also what you said about uh, your experiences with uh, with your teaching or your learning uh, uh, correctly learning concept you need to build trust that they that they come to you that they that they engage you in, in, in important and uh, academically interesting questions. And um, that means it, it's something which what you have to build up over time. And uh, and also with a lot of uh, a lot of effort and effort, which in traditional ac uh, academic communities is not highly valued. You know, lots of the time which I spent at night and you spent at night with uh, company owners, with uh, with engineers uh, in in showing them opportunities in what we could do together, we cannot write papers about it. Normally, I, I try to change a little bit the game, but uh, but still, we it's, it's very difficult to traditionally uh, uh, make academic gains out of it. So so it means also we have to rethink somehow the rules of the game, also for instance, uh, under which condition we appoint people and things like that. Now I shall ask. I shall I will not yeah. like that. So that's under the umbrella of co-creation. Yeah, yeah. 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 To that later and your perspective in innovation what can we and should we do better in, in, in europe what should we do better well europe, uh, europe is all about diversity actually and, and that's also a, a chance that an opportunity that we have and when you look at europe and and some people would say well europe is lagging behind or, 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 i mean there, there are indicators that show that japan and south korea are more innovative countries. there's more innovation but even in europe when you look at the European situation, there are countries that are, have much more innovation than others. When you look at the, there's something called the European Innovation Scoreboard, which I'm, I'm sure you're very familiar with as leader of this expert group at the European University Association. Maybe it has been criticized. Yes. I don't know. <laughs> but well, so it's, it's perhaps the first indicator, but I think you all know that some regions are more in, innovative than others. And that's also something we can learn from. We can see that, um, of course, it's correlated to wealth. Of course, it's correlated to public spending and research and innovation. But it's also correlated, and I, well, let's say that is what the school board shows, and I think we all agree, it's correlated to the percentage of people having access to higher education. It's correlated to the percentage of PhD holders, uh, foreign PhD students, um, Co international co publications, digital skills, how they are, um, uh, how they, ex uh, the extent to which they exist in the population, the uptake of lo lifelong learning offers, and that's actually where the universities come in. And so, but I would say so it, that's actually investing in the core missions of the universities, which are the research and education, it's at the same time, perhaps in an indirect way, but it's also at the same time investing. In, yeah. in innovation. And, and I think at the same time is the key word, yeah. Often by traditional academics, it's innovation is seen as a complex mm. uh, a complement other thing, mm. but innovation should be a core part of educational research, yeah, an integral part of it. Yeah? It's actually also something that we learned in 
the seminar in uh, organized by our colleagues in Maribor that actually there are ways of combining this to do have an innovation and, and we heard about the challenges, have a use case, have a proof of concept, make students learn with that. And then ideally it gives you research data. Well, it, it, I'm, well I'm in the social sciences and the humanities, so it works a bit less for us. Yeah. But I think ideally if, if, you, if you do it well, it, it gives you more research data, more research questions. Yeah. Yeah, that's the inspiration idea. can be inspiratory. Yeah. Sasha, you, you inspired us with your beautiful presentation that you are ahead of us. What's your perspective of um, are we doing the right thing? I think many aspects are quite good, definitely. I, I would just jump on the or well, under the umbrella of co-creation, definitely, because of the industry partners like it, but I would focus even on the learners part. We need to make sure that we meet the learners' interest in the future. The world is changing, even if the minds of the people out there. Even especially in Germany, when you go out of school, you're not even asked, hey, what do you do afterwards? You're getting asked, what do you study afterwards? Which is like a small drift um, from what I personally experienced. And these kind of new kind of skills and abilities and like offerings that we as universities can offer because we are good, we are educated in German in many, many fields. We have our expertise here. Um, just offer them maybe in a more flexible way um, to the learners in the future, because then they can even adjust once again, okay, I mean, even during my studies, in my bachelor studies, I had the opportunity to choose from five courses where I had to do four from, which is like not a real ability for me to, to choose. Um, I really look forward to a future where, with, especially when it comes back to the um, aspect of the micro-credential, where we really have the opportunity for our learners to gather different types of um, yeah, skills, abilities, whatever, and then even make them equivalent to a master's degree in the end, um, which is even the, the long-term vision then of the CAU University as well. In 2030, there we have an equivalent um, master degree, a so-called maybe a challenge-based master. <laughs> yeah, the, um, something like this. yeah, the freedom of idea was, was also Justina's was, was asking and demanding for, we need the room for innovation. Yeah. Uh, Hubert, uh, your perspective of what should we do better or are we already in a good place? Uh, Europe is probably the, the place in this planet where complete society is educated. No? Mm. That's a seldom privilege. No? Yeah, when I follow the idea of Justinas, who said an idea can only be innovative when it is realized. Mm. And uh, when we now think at, about university uh, years ago, practical applications were not very were not very recommended. It was not on a high level if you want to become uh, important or, or uh, an, uh, famous, then you had to do paperwork and publications and, 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 and when we really want to come to production to, to support, let's say, products, then we need to have a kind of technology transfer where we very near have to be at the companies. Uh, have very near, of course, knows the science, the, the research, but uh, brings this science and research into companies. And I'm running a technology transfer center since 1992. And uh, therefore, I always have this pass to the companies. And I think probably I have not as many publications as others, but uh, I has probably made products which others don't, didn't make. And therefore, that is my idea to have to give to give also researchers uh, a kind of of perspective if they have not only papers, but they have also practical realizations. And that is what Volker was also mentioning. We probably must a little bit change the perspective. What do we see as a high level at universities? How and especially what do we count? to enable careers. Exactly. Careers are presently not rewarded by innovation. It's papers or a hard work of teaching. Yeah. And we have to reform that. Uh, Justina, I, I loved your citation of, of, of Edison. The value of ideas comes from using it. And I think perhaps using is the source also of ideas. What's your perspective to innovation? Uh, if you want to expand from your very, very nice inspirational view of, 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 of innovation. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. I have several remarks that I would like to make here. First of all, I think that it would be great if we were able to liberalize and encourage interdisciplinary R&D. So basically, we have boxes right now that we are put into when we start academic career. And then if we're looking at something, we are looking at it in a very constrained way. But if we if we look at other players on the market, on the global market, and I'm looking to one of the continents to the West right now, I would like to, what I've noticed is that the, there are diminishing boundaries between the between the disciplines and between the studies are are the key so that they're able to see something that we're not because the truth lies somewhere in between so like if, if we were able to achieve flexible industry-driven subjects even in in those study programs and if we were able to implement this into the research and then if we were able to implement this in into the technology that, that we are creating this might lead us somewhere Another point here is that, uh, well, it's, it's only my opinion, but I think that, as I've said in the presentation, we should productize the innovations. We, we should make a, the innovation as a product itself. And then uh, when we do that, we're able to sell innovation, same as anything like a car, like a train, like a plane, like a, like a road or anything like that. And if we sell innovation, then we become innovation driven. Of course, there are conservative regions and well, I come from a slightly conservative region here, but then uh, we can listen to the market and then we can, you know, advertise. I'm not saying advertise as on TV, but we can push the message for as long as it takes for, for the uh, industry to reach it so that you are also winning from the, from the fact that we are generating innovation together. And another, another point that I wanted to make here was about um, the whole educational system uh, nowadays. Uh, because I teach uh, where software engineering is taught, what I've noticed so far that is that uh, the bachelors and the masters are no longer the right form for the people to be educated in software engineering, which is, I'm not sure about other fields, uh, probably not social sciences, but in engineering and technology, there might be a need to look for more liberal and hands-on uh, educational system where you could get like a different kind of degree. I know that in some countries there are like engineering uh, PhDs, but PhDs are good, but may maybe some basic university education that could be, uh, that could provide specialists in a shorter time because they're already ready to make it, but they're just uh, uh, aiming for, for the full package uh, might be the answer. I'm not saying that we have to drop the classical sense in no way. But some new forms of education that were like 50% would be served by industry and 50 by academia would, would might be useful. Yeah, I, I think that's for, uh, precisely the, the concept which Sasha presented to us. Yeah? Uh, the, this uh, challenge based uh, uh, learning. Uh, I think it's a fascinating uh, idea. How difficult is it to bring this system and this open innovation to your environment and to the university itself. Yeah? Uh, because, okay, uh, it's wonderful. I think in this room, we're all fascinated about innovation. So it's uh, uh, following Athena, it's, it's bringing uh, 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 O's to, to Athens. Yeah? That's a saying in German. Yeah? Uh, but uh, we still have to reform our system. And academia is a tedious, mm -hmm. slow system. How have you encountered the, the situation at, at, at your institution and how much is the share of this challenge-based forces which are part of an um, engineering or physics uh, diploma in, in, in Apple? Yeah? Um, so just talking about the use cases. We wanted 50%, no? 100%. I cannot deal with that for now, but it will come. <laughs> no, I mean, first of all, I have to uh, say that we're still in the pilot phase and we're trying out a lot. So each semester now, since the last one and a half years, was always covered with a different kind of pilot that we chose and how to try to establish these kind of challenge based learning formats into universities. The current one is more just like I, I, we have some kind of minor courses which are not part of the major, major engineering courses, more or less, where, where it is more or less like easier to establish one kind of different format of teaching because for sure as you as you know universities if you come with a new approach it, it's not like yeah let's go for it 100 percent let's go 
And um, it's always you have to argue, you have to show some kind of results. Why is it good? Why is it worth the effort of changing something and, and et cetera? And we are gathering this kind of data for now. Um, me personally, I did one of the challenge based learning course with a couple of students. I didn't uh, made it an official challenge um, with the CIU platform, but I did it with just um, students from Hamburg. And this was more or less like I, I open it up with all the flexibility they have now. They can tackle the, the topic I gave them, to them, like the broad topic. They could um, make their own challenges. They were, first of all, kind of overwhelmed by the overall flexibility they have and the freedom they have. And because they are used to, within our current educational schemes that we have here, like, do it like this. If you Google it up, you will find a way how to do it. What kind of strategy, what kind of method is that? There is no method for now, because finding your own interests is really, really tough. In these kind of broad topics, you really have to confront with yourself and see what is your interest like, what are your abilities are, um, where are your skills, what what would you like to go for? Um, and this is more or less like the main experience I can bring back from the students I dealt with. Um, and on the other hand, for sure, as, as I mentioned, we have already 70 challenges um, on the platform yet, which is Sometimes it's even difficult to find some applicants for this um, because it's even new for students and for sure they have their plans and you have to find some kind of gradation or uh, incentives for them even to put them into the regular mm -hmm. schedule of their universities because otherwise yeah. it might be too much work. Um, and then even it's difficult to reform, but we have to, we have to come back to the Middle Ages. I think the master-apprenticeship relationship is one of the most creative ones. The school learners. Yeah. And something that I found remarkable, and I, I'm sure lots of us did, as it's a d detail among many in, in your challenge approach, was that the outcome can also be a new research question. Yeah. And, and it's not just uh, an app that we can use on our phone, it's, it's not just a product. We can also accept the, 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 that we come to the conclusion that we need to more research and, and new research questions. It actually reminds me of something. Because there's also Athena before Athena. It's not, we, don't, we don't have a long history as CIU, but uh, there's, there have been projects before, uh, like uh, blended education, uh, blended mobility, and people, interdisciplinary um, teams, international interdisciplinary teams working on projects from Orléans. We only joined that last year. And we are uh, with two master students from a sports science master who actually were looking to go into into some sports related profession afterwards. And after developing this project, they actually think now about publishing. They think about doing a PhD. And actually, that's, it's just it was such a wonderful illustration of what we just said before. Actually, it doesn't have to be an opposition. You know, right. it's, it's innovation and uh, uh, development. Plus research doesn't it can it can have everything together. It's a remarkable room for creating creativity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Justine has one question. Uh, is this the innovation soup industry wants? Yeah. Uh, and and how did you manage in the Baltic countries? Yeah. One of the most remarkable transitions to really being one of the innovation leaders in, in digital technologies of the Baltic countries is is how did you do it? Yeah. Here in our region, we continue doing cars for 600 years and have difficult turning on a computer. Uh, uh, how do you manage via courses or to, to control this innovation soup? Because it's more than just this Darwinistic funnel. It's how do you create this interaction and, and promote it locally? How did you do it in the Baltic? You see, we had we had one very interesting opportunity here, and I think we used it, is that we are young and we don't have a baggage coming behind us, right? So then we are very dynamic. We can implement whatever we want, and then we can try it. We can be the testing ground. And I think that there 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 have been several contributions to that. One of them is uh, implementing some of the opportunities that the European uh, regulations gave us. Uh, because we were lighter. And one of those is the digital signature. So where you can identify yourself exactly the way that you would be physical. You, you would have physical presence and sign something, right? And you can do that remotely very easily. Why? We had no infrastructure. Then building something on top is very easy. When you have something already, you have to demolish it first and then build something new. But demolishing it, it takes a lot of effort. So 
I think the the ability to be very dynamic because we're small and young uh, was the the key ingredient, uh, along with uh, well the political will from uh, from the local local government and implementation of the regulations and directives coming from the EU. So this led to the digital innovation. But when it comes to some industrial innovation, like you mentioned before, like steel or, or vehicle production, uh, it takes a lot of time to build up because it's a, it, it has a lot of physical presence. It needs resources allocated somewhere. It needs expertise that is built over very long. You see, the software uh, development itself, it's so dynamic that if you have a lot of experience, well, not a lot of experience, but if you're an old software developer, the chances are that you don't know something because you know too much from the past, because things change very fast, right? So we took this opportunity, I think, to implement the IT things, which are very dynamic, and we don't have anything behind us lagging. But then we're not able to go into the heavy industries that you are winning forever, like forever. Yeah, I think that's that's the whole point. But the question was that the, is that the innovation soup? I think this is a very big part of that innovation soup. Uh, I'm not sure if that's a complete soup. Maybe we need some spices to be added, but that is going to happen over time. Okay. Uh... Yeah, I think it's important, and uh, coming back to what you said, Peter, about the uh, apprenticeship, I think uh, an important element of innovation soup is uh, probably uh, understanding learning in a new way or in a, in a, uh, in a non uh, radio type of way that somebody has knowledge and others are listening to it. Uh, it's co-construction, but it's also working with, you know, um, that's why I saw your challenges uh, project, uh, why at least in our interpretation, it was uh, of that type that the students really went into the companies. And uh, being in the companies, they had a little bit of experience as in, uh, similar to an apprentice. Uh, you know, so they, they were in the company, they could, and it's not only about knowing, it's also about uh, identity, it's about uh, how to feel in, in, in being inside the company, of learning how the, how, the, how the more experienced people attitude towards problems and problem solving, you know, this is, um, you know, and uh, on the other hand, with, uh, with a little bit of, uh, of university behind the students in our case, um, they sometimes were able to bring in innovations into the companies also by reflecting their practices through our engagement somehow. So there, there was, and, and I think uh, this type of, uh, we need to think of learning in a more complex manner. And, uh, and uh, I think universities um, need to overcome this lecture type of, uh, of, uh, of, of business. This is really old fashioned and, uh, and we, uh, we will not be able to, to, uh, to cope with the global challenges, I think. Yeah. yeah, I think we need the, the, the room, yeah, the room and time, yeah, which Justina said, yeah, and and and, and, and Hubert, perhaps you, you have been very active in our region, which is a, a very traditional. We have a lot of baggage, yeah. We have a very competitive industry, yeah, but it's uh, metal oriented. We have companies which are 600 years old, yeah, uh, and still have a leading position in special markets uh, in this planet, yeah. So it's absolutely remarkable, but. Uh, uh, then what's uh, for us or for Athena now, how can we create this open environment in a bit more complex environment with a lot of baggage yeah? where we have uh, uh, traditional industries? Do we have the means, uh, although we have tens of thousands of, 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 of researchers, yeah? how do we bring this to a more open environment? Where do you see there are the challenges and opportunities? I think uh, in the moment digitalization is in every mouse uh, uh, in the moment and of course digitalization in this classical traditional uh, factories and, and, and uh, traditional old companies uh, uh, makes a lot of efforts to bring it inside. That means we must show some advantage. We must also in our small universities probably we must try to be not try to to cope and copy what uh, others have done five years ago. We must try to come to the new things, like for example, 
5G in communication or now 6G in communication. That means communication, I think, is an important part also in the traditional uh, classical companies. China has the first satellite launched 6G. Nobody knows what it is doing with 6G, but they have done it already. And when we wait until others have also done things, we must think, what is 6G? What can we do with 6G? What is technology necessary in this area? And therefore, we must even, we as a small university must try to work on that topic. Forget that we don't know how 4G has working. We were not on top in that, in that time. But uh, if we, and that is a package which we have on, it, on uh, our back, we must forget it and uh, see what is the future and concentrate on these things. Yeah, in a global world where winner takes it all and the second place doesn't learn anything anymore, we have also to change our strategy yeah. to make very specialized niche. Uh, or perhaps first to to to, to add one question: uh, the, uh, Do we have? You are also vice president, yeah, for your university. That's right. Do we have the the correct incentivization mechanisms to create this wonderful dream? Yeah, uh, or how do we get it? I, yeah, I don't think we have it actually. And but and there's I'm I'm thinking of something that uh, actually at the University of Orléans, we took place with our partner universities in the same region. We took uh, part in a case study by the Joint um, Research Center of the European Commission. JRC, so what, exactly, Sevilla. Exactly, exactly, Sevilla, and, and it's, uh, it was called Higher Education for Smart Specialization, but exactly about how universities contribute to this regional ecosystem, or how they, how, how they can contribute, and. Uh, there was another case study, I think, about Lithuania, by the way, um, on higher education for smart specialization. And while we are doing this, they actually presented to us a, a tool that I thought was quite interesting, and it's it's not known enough. Uh, it's it's called um, HE Innovate. Maybe you know about it, and maybe you criticize it as well. And I think it can, well, it can be criticized. But I, I think that's actually quite interesting because we. We are swamped with these quantitative indicators at the university. So it's all about accountability and everything has to be expressed somehow in figures. And I think, well, coming from the social sciences, I think it's often we miss something when it's only about figures. Mm. It's also about quality. And when you look at this tool, with the self-assessment tool developed by the European Commission and the OECD, actually it's, it's not just about figures, but it's actually asking yourself questions as an institution. So do you have a strategy, do you have a mission, mission statement about innovation, about entrepreneurial activities? Is there any, do you have, really have support mechanisms for students, for staff who want to engage in innovation, entrepreneurial activities? That's more really long-term oriented. And I think that's really, I would wish that we could do this in our alliance, but each answer these questions, answer them together, maybe criticize it together, and see what common strategy we can come up with but have like more uh, sort of long-term strategic changes in the university if we really want to go forward in that sense there also has to be a consensus that we want it yeah at the ua we started also a questionnaire of all 800 oh, right. mem okay. members and it's very interesting to see mm. their Universities are embracing innovation as a core mission. Already 75% of European mm -hmm. universities have innovation strategies in place. Mm -hmm. yeah. We didn't read it, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's starting to go along that route. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's slowly changing. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, we have to see how we, we bring it further. Yeah. Uh, next vice president or mm -hmm. vice rector of our university in charge of I, especially the, the topic. Uh, would you like to uh, comment on how do we reconcile innovation strategy transformation how do we embed it to our teaching mission yeah. the teaching uh, and, and uh, research and everywhere yeah, let me uh, let me uh, say one thing before where i disagree with both of you i i i don't think that um that starting from scratch and uh, is the only strategy which we should find good i think uh, i think the european model is also one of specifically maybe the german um, and the uh, 
the Südwestfalen uh, model of innovation is one of gradual innovation, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, that means building on what is already existing and mm -hmm. refining, coming uh, dealing with new challenges, improving and using also the uh, qualification level of the of, of the workers, which uh, which is uh, for, for Germany. Uh, a strong competitive edge. So I think uh, I think we need both. We need uh, something mm -hmm. like of this uh, groundbreaking things, and we need to see how we uh, specifically at universities of our type how we uh, implement mm -hmm. it. But I think also the incremental innovation is a is a very important one, and uh, and we need to uh, we, we need we need to value that high. I think. Uh, yeah. Or, or there just as an answer, I think incremental is perfectly fine. It only has to find its niche, yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and distinguishability, yeah. And so we need both, yeah? yeah, the radical new attempts and the gradual. And yeah. the gradual ones are the ones feeding all of us. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. And, and with regard to what you said, I I, I mean the German uh, university system uh, is somehow privileged, so we don't feel that so much. Uh, mm -hmm. Privileged in the sense that we are we have very little uh, evaluation on German universities. Uh, that's maybe a little bit changing with the new payment scheme, but uh, schema, but uh, but we have very little evaluations if you compare it to the UK or to Sweden or to the Netherlands. Uh, we are a pretty privileged uh, place still, and so we could do. I I, I honestly am. Uh, I said that at lunch. I'm honestly a little bit. Disappointed with the German academic system that so we have so many uh, freedoms and so many uh, options to do interesting things which we really love uh, that uh, that that we don't come up with uh, with 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 uh, better performance is maybe not I don't mean it in a quantitative manner with a, with a, uh, with a more societally oriented ways of innovation but also maybe. Uh, with more groundbreaking ideas, you know, I think I think we need to reform the German university system. It's uh, from my point of view much too hierarchical. All these uh, big professors and uh, and and they need to be uh, in the in the German sense of and uh, 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 things and uh, you know and then this uh, this uh, this uh, you know also the, the attitude towards students and uh, I think we, we we need a cultural change in German universities to uh, to use more of, of our opportunities and 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 and, and the, the things we do there's a lot Germany can learn from you, our European colleagues, yeah, yeah, which are in, in many places much more advanced and open. Yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah? And, and we're trapped in a very old tradition. Yeah? Uh, okay, it gives us a chance with Athena, for example, that we learn other, other cultures, other methodologies, and it, it supports ourselves. Yeah. I think that's the inspirational interaction where Athena can, can bring and, uh, and is already bringing us a lot. And so uh, I greatly appreciate that. Uh, I don't know if we have some questions from the, the auditorium, because I wanted to switch a bit more to the talents, or what do we do with the, with the learners? Okay. One interesting question related to education to Justina um, from Nuno. He's asking, uh, can education become somehow a barrier to innovation, biasing open thinking? Guiding thinking through common ground Ooh, and limiting job. exploration of new ways. So, what do you say? Should we stop teaching? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I didn't get that. It's the sound is a little bit bad. Is there is, is the question right. anywhere written? The question was uh, from from Nuno, uh, also from the Athena Consortium, whether uh, teaching can sometimes also mislead us to block innovation. It traps us in, in, in classical thinking. Uh, uh, is yes, of course, yes, yeah. most naturally. Yeah. Uh, it, it is very interesting to see um, uh, when you go to teach classes and then when you go and when you stick to the very classical sense of teaching, basically you're uh, overpowering the student and you're just basically feeding the student the information. But you're never actually very much interested in the feedback. You get some feedback, but it's not the main product that you're looking for. But if you if you end up in 
involving the students or involving the ones that you're educating to provide the information in a real time, you can readjust things. And that's what happens, especially with, the, well, I teach two, two kinds of students. Some of, some of them are engineering students, some of them are social uh, sciences students. So engineering students, they don't care about feedback, they don't care about anything. They just give me the assignment and you know I will fulfill the assignment and that's all. But when it comes to social uh, sciences, uh, students are very much keen to provide their feedback and then they, they always want to direct your teaching. So I've never had similar years teaching similar subjects Every year, never have I ever had a similar year with similar material that has been taught. Because after the class, the students would come up to me and say, okay, this was very interesting, but can you tell us more about this? Because that's not so interesting for us. And then if it's in the scope of, of the domain, you just, you know, just shift a little bit, but uh, not, not being able to listen uh, is kind of, a, it's kind of a, a drawback here. And what I've noticed also from the perspective of education and teaching is that uh, the, the feedback got significantly less uh, during the COVID period because of the remote teaching. Uh, I, when I was teaching in classes, I, I knew all of my students' names. I knew them by heart. I knew their character. But now I have to guess all the time. Yeah, uh, I think we're all trapped by these uh, limitations, and uh, uh, which are totally unfortunate, but which will we will get over that. Yeah, uh, but uh, coming back to teaching, uh, perhaps to Sasha, the, what's your feedback from the teachers working in in in, in, in your uh, challenge-based uh, learning classes? How are they developing and coping with this? Uh, I mean, the main key payout. Because you, you said it was mainly students and PhDs doing the courses. Mm -hmm. Do you have one big German professor doing one of these? Or how do you, would you get one of this? Not in Hamburg, unfortunately, not yet. <laughs> but they will come as soon as they see some, uh, see some results from the PhD candidates. Maybe then it's, that it's working, etc. And then it's interesting for them. But the main feedback I got from the teachers for now was always that they even learned a lot. Mm. That was even the, the best feedback I possibly could hear from them because that's more or less like the approach is more or less like eating up with one. Mm. Because it's, they're part of the team, they should learn. And there's so much out there. Nobody from us can, can say that he or she knows everything about a certain topic. It's not even possible. Mm. Even if they say so, they just declare themselves that they do not. Mm. Um, this is then always coming back to um, be flexible, be open-minded as a teacher, as well as a learner, as well as a teacher then and the combination, and try to reflect on the people's interest. And then even a slight different answer to the, to the question as well, or um, in addition to what Justine has just said, our challenges, for example, are, I, and I'm happily inviting everybody to, to read one of those challenges, just to get an idea how they are formulated, because it's very, very broad. Then we have the challenge now for us because we are offering micro modules like teaching units to these challenges, which are not leading to a kind of a solution for them. They should come up with their own critical thinking, their own solutions, their own ideas. And if we, for example, then give a micro module in terms of how to build cars and recommend it to this challenge, they already have focus on, OK, maybe the challenge deals with cars and we should go for this. This is more or less like major part putting the learner into the center mm. and um, yeah, using what I'm not using, but um, providing kind of abilities to the teacher to, to guide them, to facilitate the overall process of coming up to, a, to an individual solution. It links also back to what Volker says. Actually, it's not, I mean, it, this outdated model of the professor sharing information. Who needs information? Or information is available for free. So actually, they should, and then too much of it actually. So it's more about learning how to learn, learning how to find where to find information, how to deal with information, and, and knowledge, how to generate knowledge, how to ask the good questions. And yeah, but it's 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 a paradigm shift really for our, for our university teachers. It's completely a paradigm shift for us all. And 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 I think it's inspirational. You're double wrong, Justina of being a CTO and being a teacher. Yeah? And uh, my question would be how this can be very credible 
only if we do it together with the inspiration from, from industry. Uh, how's your feeling of we also have a bit more traditional industrial colleagues of the their willingness to cooperate in, in reforming education. That was actually quite uh, unexpected for me to experience, but uh, the interest from where I work or where I used to work in many places is always very high. So uh, my former uh, employers, when I offered them to sign collaboration contracts with the university, they were standing first in line. They really much, very much wanted to do so. Uh, and after that, uh, many of the uh, many of the students, uh, because in Lithuania we have the system uh, during your bachelor's and your master's, you have to have like a uh, like an internship. So these internships have to be uh, done in well in private companies or governmental bodies or wherever you like, but it has to be in an, in, well, in an entity. So we had, in the first year we had, I think three students that were participating and doing internships uh, for, the, for those companies. And uh, the following year it was five. Uh, and well, then I changed the jobs and I cannot tell you anything more about this, this development. But anyway, the perspective that we get uh, and why it's so important because uh, being in university and in the industry at the same time, you, you can very easily feel or, or sense how uh, one each of them are looking at each other. And surprisingly, it's very positive. Mm -hmm. okay. More comments to that? Otherwise, I would take one question here, which is a slightly different topic. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And so we have here also questions from the, the auditorium. Uh, uh, asking about this common uh, research and innovation indicators, the innovation scoreboard, which mm -hmm. Anne just presented, uh, and uh, what it counts. Yeah. And so I can describe it a bit. Yeah, it has like roughly 20 parameters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, 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 the innovation intensity of industry, the numbers of, of workers in, in high skilled jobs, number of patents, number of uh, liaisons, etc. And uh, but at the end, I'm fully with with Anne. Yeah, uh, not everything uh, that counts can be counted. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this is a very nice quote. I forgot from from who it was, but it's perfectly right, especially in the field of innovation, which is a joint soup. Yeah, uh, and and so uh, the, this this impact factors. Yeah, uh, they are very tempting. Yeah. All uh, the European Commission, the, the national states are valuing innovation higher, yeah? but they want an answer from universities, how should we count it? Yeah? Uh, and, and that's something which presently we have been uh, 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 trying to avoid, yeah? because innovation depends on the environment, yeah? uh, but where we have to, to tackle that at some time. Yeah? And so perhaps, a question, I don't know if any one of you wants to comment on, on, on counting or not counting. Uh, we have to answer, yeah? because okay, we, we spend horrendous amounts of taxpayers' money in, 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 in doing our institutions. Yeah? We have an innovation mission. When do we count it as successful? Yeah? Uh, and how should we make it? We need better marketing, yeah? as, as Justina was saying. Yeah? It's not highly valued. Yeah? But it's also not highly valued because we, we, we haven't found a good way to advertise it, to advocate for it, and, 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 and to engage and, and, and to motivate yeah? also in careers. Anyone volunteering to comment on this question, which I already started uh, commenting? Yeah. Okay. Your innovation <laughs> paper now. How will we motivate our colleagues to jump in? into this mission. Oh. Yeah. I, I don't um, I mean um, probably there is some stats necessary or I, I mean if the if the taxpayers represented by the politicians sort of think that they uh, that they need something like that but then we need to I mean um, I I would rather like to speak about um, case studies Mm -hmm. of 
intra, you know, to combine qual and quant somehow uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, to 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 look for interesting case studies where we really have achieved something uh, in in the cooperation between universities and uh, yeah. and and industries. And also, I mean, the the, the statistics have the disadvantages that they often don't tell you what to do. You know, they they're just mm -hmm. descriptive, but they uh, but they don't help you to really uh, improve. While with case studies, you could maybe uh, uh, you could maybe learn from each other how certain mechanisms and and certain um, uh, ways of collaboration have worked. And uh, I think we need to uh, we need to put that in a in a in a way which which helps improving, not so much as at describing. Uh, we may need also some descriptive statistics, of course, but. Uh, but but I'm uh, I'm more in favor of thinking of how to make people learn from each other and and uh, and improve, improve our innovation system. Success stories and good ideas yeah. as this yeah. open yeah. Yeah. Uh, this open teaching platform. Yeah. And would you like to comment? Uh, yes, success stories and and actually I was on yesterday. Well, that's progress for you. Uh, well, actually, I was traveling to Siegen at the same time, attending a meeting at the French Ministry for uh, Higher Education Research and Innovation, actually, innovation in its title, the, the French National Ministry, Higher Education. It's the three missions, actually, in the title. We often forget about it, this I. Um, and actually, there were some uh, European University alliances describing a bit how they engage with their regional ecosystem. And, and we've got another example here with ECIU. And actually, it was all about um, a word that you already mentioned about niche, actually. So it's, it's really defining what we can bring to, I would say, not just the industry, also the public sector, uh, society, other, other partners, everything that's around us. And, that's something that we've started to do in Athena uh, to, to see that. So, well, we've got this joint expertise, and because it's joint, it's actually better. It's wider. We can offer you something on smart sensors applied to so many different uh, case, cases and, uh, and well, in so many contexts. Because it's not just Siegen and smart sensors; it's, it's uh, seven universities working on smart sensors, cybersecurity. And lots of others. Now, I think it's something that you did as well. It's, it's actually the first phase was actually to say we've got an expertise on smart cities and smart communities, and 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 that's that's probably something we need to do mm -hmm. before and, and not just ask industrial partners and economic partners, uh, local authorities, what do you want from us, but they really offer something to them, and and then then it becomes a, this virtuous circle when we have success stories. Mm -hmm. And we can I, I, I suppose it's how it works um, with your challenge yeah. challenges as well, because some challenges are probably finished and, and, and we've got results to show and, and then it definitely that encourages then other industry partners once again mm -hmm. just to collaborate even closer with us and showing mm -hmm. even some results for them that they can establish in their daily business, um, which is very much yeah, mm -hmm. likely used as an incentive for them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That will, we have good cases of showing this for sure. This is still a pilot phase, so we are. And, and the challenge is just to get better understanding for this. We may we even offer different formats of this. We have nano, mini, and standard challenges, even strategic ones, and they only differ between time, uh, how much time the learners, including the teacher, then have um, just to deal with this kind of a challenge. And for sure, the results will depend on the time they can deal with it. But on the same way, the expectation management then through the industry partner will just offer a nano challenge, which is just on a daily basis, yeah. or mini challenges in weekly basis. For sure, we cannot give the best innovative ideas out of this, but maybe mm -hmm. some minor steps going for something. And, and at the end, it's much more the talents than the ideas. Mm -hmm. we, we, we forget that the, the, the highest impact and in innovation which we bring is, is the talents we educate. Or well, if, if Nuno doesn't want us to stop <laughs> teaching them and spoiling them for for being creative, but uh, uh, the talents and I think this the networks yeah, offer and we have to create a good way to interconnect needs. Yeah, this open marketplace of ideas inspired by industry or other actors in our environment, uh, and to relate that to. To the people and the talents who want to join that, yeah, I think that's one of the, 
the common goals uh, for the future. Okay, uh, so uh, we're close to the end, yeah. And so uh, uh, I, I really enjoyed the discussion a lot. Yeah? I, I think it's inspirational. Yeah, uh, a discussion is wonderful if one comes out of a discussion with many more ideas and tasks than what we get in. Yeah, I totally left this this. Uh, uh, the uh, thing uh, uh, half an hour ago, yeah? uh, mm -hmm. but I think that uh, uh, I, I really would really great to thank you for all the inspirational ideas yeah, coming from each one of you. Yeah? Uh, I think uh, we have to 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 spread the 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 ideas to transform our old academy uh, system, especially in Germany. Yeah? Oh, well, uh, and we have to start <laughs> and we have to start with our own. Yeah? France is also very centralized. I think it's also not easy. Yeah, uh, but but we have a lot to learn and perhaps help each other in, in this transformational process, which I think is important to to, to maintain the the wonderful environment which we have here in Europe. And so I would like to thank all of you. And uh, before we end, I would like to pass over uh, to to Ilka to give a, a final uh, uh, information uh, on Athena. And I uh, uh, goodbye to everyone. Yeah? But uh, please wait still for some. Uh, open innovation uh, toolbox, which we already have prepared. And Athena would like to advertise a bit uh, before we end the session. So thank you very much, Peter. Thank you all for this very interesting and fruitful discussion. I think you probably could go on like this for another one or two hours, but our time is almost over. So uh, if there are any more questions from the audience, also maybe popping up later, just feel free to contact us and we will be happy to get back to you or to forward the questions to our panelists. And also what has been said before, uh, within Athena, we are currently still trying to establish a well-functioning network between our seven partner institutions and the local industry. So if you are interested in becoming part of the Athena network, just feel free to get in touch with us and we will be more than happy to yeah, contact you and to um, inform you about future events and activities of Athena. So before I come to the end of the seminar, I just want to draw your attention to one of our service offers. So what I wanted to show you is uh, our Praxis online platform for internships. So um, this is basically an online portal where companies, research institutions, but also universities can offer internships or advertise planned projects. And then students can register here and search for these offer offers actively. And for companies, this platform offers a very wide range and it can help to find good students for a short internship or even for a longer period of time. And at the same time, the platform supports students in finding internships on an international level. So, and this goes out to all our participants from the industry. If your company is looking for student interns, try out this platform and uh, just load up your service or your, your internship offers here. Of course, the platform works better and better the more offers we have here. So also, please feel free to advertise this platform within your ecosystem. So much about our seminar today. The next seminar will um, take place in exactly a week from now. Hubert already mentioned it in his introduction on December the 7th. And uh, this uh, next seminar will be hosted by our colleagues in Orléans in France. And the title of the seminar will be Fostering Linguistic Diversity, How Can European Universities Become Truly Multilingual? And of course, online participation will be possible here as well. And then another week later, uh, on December 14th, there will be another seminar hosted by our colleagues in Porto, dealing with the legal frameworks for, effect, for, for an effective cooperation. And here, um, the question will be asked, what can be done to speed up the transformation of higher education in Europe? And also here you can register and participate online. And then in the end of February, the 28th of February, um, there will be the roundtable discussion with national and European stakeholders. Um, as Hubert said before, uh, this is uh, basically the final and summing up event of our seminar series. So based on the results of our first seminar, Martina will here make policy proposals at this event. So please keep these dates in mind. Okay, so. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you to all our speakers, to our panelists for this 
very great presentations and the very interesting introduction or the very interesting discussion afterwards. I would also, of course, like to thank all our participants on site and online. And of course, I would like to um, thank especially the whole Athena Siegen team and here especially those people that you have not seen on the camera today, but that have been very active and busy preparing the seminar today and uh, also today in the background uh, dealing with the technique. So uh, thank you very much. We were a bit worried until the very end if we could really carry out this event uh, in a hybrid format due to the difficult circumstances at the moment, but we are really happy that it did work out. So thank you very much again. Have a nice evening. Stay safe and healthy. Goodbye and auf Wiedersehen.